Welcome to day two of the Future Security Forum 2021. So I'm proud to introduce our first panel of the day, U.S. Leaves Afghanistan, What Next? We're joined by Ambassador Roya Rahmani, former Afghan ambassador to the United States and a non-resident senior fellow at New America, retired Colonel Gianni Koskinas, a senior fellow at the International Security Program at New America, Shamila Chaudhary, senior South Asia fellow in the International Security Program, uh, and former director for Pakistan and Afghanistan in the U.S. National Security Council, uh, and Fatima Gailani, president of the Afghan Red Crescent Society. The conversation will be moderated by Candace Rondeau, who directs the Future Frontlines Project at New America and is a professor of practice at Arizona State University. Thank you so much. To you, Candace. Thanks, Daniel. And thanks also to Dean Madavi for her excellent comments sort of setting us up. Um, we have a illustrious panel here and a lot to get into. But first, let me just start by reminding the audience um, that we will get to Q&A. Uh, we really want to encourage you to be part of the conversation. Um, in order to submit your questions, we'll be using uh, sly.do um, to submit questions. And the sly.do is the box located at the right of the video. If you have any issues, just please contact the events at newamerica.org uh, and somebody will help you get sorted out on your questions. So let me um, begin, first of all, before uh, you know, opening it up to the panel here, uh, by setting the scene a little bit. I think we all kind of know um, what has happened over the last three weeks. No, no surprises for, for many of us who've been tracking uh, events in Afghanistan. Um, we, I think, would have expected that there would have been a challenge in the U.S. exit, no matter when it was time for or how. Um, however, uh, the scale of the chaos that met the exit, I think, surprised many people. Uh, the rapid fall of Kabul to the Taliban uh, within just you know the course of basically three weeks um, also was very surprising to many. And, and yet, um, some of those signs were there early that the bargain that the Trump administration had crafted and the Biden administration decided to ex execute on with the Taliban was far from perfect, was deeply flawed, um, and still um, was only kind of partially baked. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but also just noting uh, that we are still hearing from Secretary of State Anthony Blinken about um, his interpretation of events uh, and how the State Department um, responded to the exit in Afghanistan, where there are still notably thousands of Afghan Americans and green card holders who are stuck looking to get out, um, trying to navigate a very chaotic and very dangerous situation. Um, and of course, there are a number of Afghans, uh, untold numbers really, uh, who are eligible, of course, for special immigrant visas or P2 status, who are still trying to figure out how best to navigate a very thorny, complex, challenging situation on the ground. Um, and when and how to get out of the country. But let's most importantly remember that this is a country of 35 million people plus um, that is sandwiched between uh, two very difficult neighbors, Iran and Pakistan. Um, we have to take Afghanistan, not just in the context of US policy, um, but regional policy. And we'll be turning to Shamila Chowdhury to give us a little bit more perspective on that. But um, of course, a question on everybody's mind right now is how did this happen? How did we get to this point where the U.S. exit, um, after 20 years of investment, um, many lives lost, um, much sacrifice, much money spent, how did we reach the point where we end up with the Taliban back in power again? Um, and I think, you know, I, I heard that Anthony Blinken made a comment um, in his testimony uh, about his interpretation of events and particularly referenced a call with former president, Afghan president Ashraf Ghani, uh, that between himself and Ghani on August 14th, in which Ghani said he would fight to the death um, to defend Afghanistan against the Taliban at the time. So that was only you know, literally 10, 12 days before the collapse of, of uh, Kabul um, that Ghani was making this apparent uh, passionate plea for the United States to stick it out stick by him. Um, and that makes us all wonder, I'm sure. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk to Fatima a little bit about um, her inside view uh, on what, what transpired. But of course, everybody is wondering, why did Ghani um, leave? Why did, he, why did he exit so quickly? What 
what were the motivating factors there? Um, what were the signs and, and sort of signals that he was interpreting um, at the time that made him think the Taliban would not act responsibly? And then also, what was the impact of that psychologically? Were there tremors? Were there um, hints that perhaps things would go um, as badly as they did um, earlier in the negotiation process that perhaps we were not aware of? Fatima, let me turn to you uh, to get your perspective on negotiations with the Taliban um, in the couple months leading up to uh, the U.S. exit, and then the fallout with Ashraf Ghani. What's your take? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it is very important. Although it's very late for these talks, I wish we had talked about this, so many things could have been prevented. But still, it is nice to know what had happened. First of all, at the, from, from the very beginning of uh, the talks, yes, Taliban were very, very difficult. Um, and uh, but the uh, our side, the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan side, was not realistic at all. Several times uh, in our meetings, our internal meetings, I asked uh, our colleagues to put it on record that I had said that even fifty percent of our desired uh, situation is better to be signed and sealed than coming out with nothing at all. And we did come out with nothing at all. And the reason was that, uh, unfortunately, our government, especially the president, was living in a total um, bubble. Uh, I don't know why, what he was counting about. I mean, even when my colleagues sometimes were saying that, look, the country is falling one, I mean, uh, one place after another. He said, oh, no, 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 we are going to get, get it back. Oh, oh, no, we are good. Four months we wasted that uh, bad uh, Trump will go, good Biden will come, and a miracle will happen, and everything will change. And that change never happened. I knew it does not happen. Again, I told them that I put it on the record, that a president who won as a vice president was encouraging President uh, Obama to get out of Afghanistan. Why wouldn't he get out when everything has started by uh, President Trump? And why wouldn't he have a good excuse to just finish it? So it was a difficult situation. One side uh, was in a total bubble, and the other side um, uh, was Taliban, very stubborn, and they knew that they are going to gain terrains, and eventually they will have it. And then the most important thing that I felt at that time, that the message which comes to us and the, the message which goes to Taliban from the American side is not really the same message. Because in the conversation that I could see that we are, uh, we are not in the same page at all. So all this made uh, the negotiations very, very difficult. And uh, I could see that from the uh, Republic side, uh, the feet were dragged and uh, looking for excuses, a mistrust um, on the Qatar involvement, the Qatar, uh, I mean, mediation that I thought would have been very good if we, from day one, we did have a mediator. I've never seen ever in my life that you have such an important peace talks, let alone peace talks, even if you have an ordinary political negotiations, how could it go on without a mediator? And our president had uh, decided that we should not have a mediator. But these are the things that uh, the conversation uh, didn't happen uh, properly, and the mediation uh, did, was not there, and the um, uh, the negotiation absolutely went badly. But then, at the very end, when we saw that everything is gone and the country uh, is falling, uh, one after another province is falling in the hand of um, Taliban, um, then two of our, especially one of our, uh, negotiators, they uh, they talked with the president face to face, and uh, the president two months before the end said that yes, the time has come that he he has to step down, and, uh, and a peaceful uh, transfer of power should happen, and this was happening. This was happening when we were working on uh, on the list. The last list came. Uh, the name of Mr. Muhib was on the list. And uh, we we told the president that it, he will, um, President Mr. Mohib will never be accepted uh, 
uh, by the Taliban. But now we know all this was just act. All this was act, just the killing times. The airplane was ready to go and fetch uh, um, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, President Karzai, with a group of uh, of uh, important, um, I mean, politicians to come here. So we will have the end. At least we have it. We have it in a regular, proper way. Um, so uh, the transfer of power will be uh, regulated, not just in a chaotic situation. And we were just on this calling who's coming, who's not coming, the airplane, what time the airplane come. Then all of a sudden, oops, the president has run away. And this, in a matter of hours, according to our two colleagues, the, the, the palace was empty. That story that people were at the door of the, um, uh, of the palace, these two people left the palace nearly two hours after, pres after the president. There was no one at the door. So much no one at the door that uh, they got worried that the looters will enter the palace because there was nobody. So our colleagues and ex-president Karzai called the Taliban to come and take the security. So where were those people that the president were scared of and ran away? I believe that when ship is sunk, sinking and the captain will sink with it, not to put other people in, uh, in, in, in panic and the lives. If they die, they die together. And this didn't happen there. And the chaos that you see until now is because of that. The police disappeared, everything, and then it took a long time for the Taliban to enter Kabul because they were not familiar. Actually, our people were uh, guiding them, go left, go right, and, and, and how to go there. So, <laughs> you're saying that uh, ex-president Ghani told uh, the foreign secretary that he will be fighting till last minute. He had also told some other important people that when uh, it comes to a very difficult situation, some of his guards has the order to shoot him. So that brave guy, what happened? That all of a sudden became... So scared that went? I don't know. So this is going to be a question for the ages. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I want to drill down a little bit more before we turn to some other folks here, uh, because you, you've really um, painted a very harrowing narrative in which um, as early as you know April, it sounds like, of this year, when President Biden made his very firm announcement, in fact, that the pullout would occur, uh, that at, at minimum it would occur by September uh, you know, 11th, uh, a very strong sign, couldn't be more strong than that. Um, Ashraf Ghani was in a mindset where essentially he was thinking, new guy, new chapter, turning the page, rewriting the bargain, essentially, rewriting the deal. But the deal hadn't even really been fully inked, as, as you're describing it. It sounds like um, there were a number of issues still on the table that needed to be resolved. Um, there's a sort of 50% that you needed to get one way or the other. What were, what were some of the sticking points um, that you think might have been movable before uh, this kind of collapse? And while we were still at a point where it was still possible to talk to the Taliban and negotiate, what were some of the big obstacles that you saw? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I want to say that uh, President uh, Biden it was a, not a new guy. He was a guy that we knew as the vice president, and we knew very well his view that he was very much against the presence of uh, American troops in Afghanistan, and they wanted them to go home. Why we all of a sudden wanted, uh, we, we created a new face, a new set of mind for him, I don't understand. Because all along, all along, I had said it, that a person who wanted the American soldiers out as the vice president, what would stop him not to do it when he was the president? This is one thing. I think it was not just the president. Few people around him, they had no experience. They had no experience whatsoever running a country. They had no business to be in that important jobs. They were just few 
um, I don't want to <laughs> use the word cowboys, but I mean, <laughs> uh, but, but a few people that they enjoy that grandeur and uh, being in control and uh, just doing things. And they had no recognition of the people of Afghanistan. They were totally disconnected from the people of Afghanistan. While the Taliban very skillfully negotiating uh, surrounding surrendering of uh, provinces after provinces under their nose, and they were acting like they know everything. They didn't even feel it. So this is the job of the government. I have nothing. To, I'm not governmental. I was not governmental. I was uh, neutral for a long, long time as the president of the Afghan Red Christian Society, which I'm not now. Um, I'm just in the board. But what did go wrong was that peace talk here was not taken seriously by ourselves. It was taken seriously by the international community. It was taken extremely seriously by the Qataris. But it was not taken seriously by uh, our government. And I don't think it was taken seriously by the Taliban because they knew that they are going to uh, to win. And um, the demands they had were the demands that was absolutely taboo uh, for the Republic. But we, as the negotiators, we did send the message uh, to the president a good six months before the end that um, we think that we should be flexible. We think that we cannot carry on without a, a mediator. We thought, yes, the mediation of the United Nations is very important, but even the mediation of uh, Qatar will be good enough. Qatar will not put uh, the name of such an important country uh, in a stake and take side this side or the other. Uh, so all these suspicions, I mean, suspicious acts and all that, I, if I had known, I wouldn't have lended my name to that, uh, that process. I really did. But I want to say one positive sentence, that peace negotiation is not finished. Now Afghanistan needs inside the country to have the ownership of peace negotiations between all peoples, people of Afghanistan. And they should restart it there. The Taliban could start it there. Everyone could start it there. The peace ministry exists. And I think it is extremely important that we should do it our way this time. 100%. I, I, I couldn't agree more. That, that This is just the beginning of a new chapter uh, in a very long conflict that has been ongoing for almost 50 years, uh, unbroken. And um, there's still a lot left on the table to negotiate and navigate. Let me turn to Ambassador Rahmani, because I think you'll have some take on, on that issue, which is what is left uh, to negotiate right now. And also um, kind of get your read on, uh, just from a kind of foreign uh, ministry point of view, kind of the, the impact of the Taliban's takeover on, uh, you know, the regional uh, relationship, but also what the UN should do there from your point of view. Uh, Ambassador Rahmani. Greetings to all, and uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, so what is left uh, to negotiate? Uh, there is one thing for sure as a fact that whoever and whenever tried to rule Afghanistan by imposing their views, uh, by being exclusive, by forcing people one way or another, have never succeeded. The result is this unwinding conflict that people have been bearing the brunt of. The real losers of all the, the entire situation is the very people of Afghanistan. Whether they are on the ground or trying to flee or some who have already fled. They are the losers. Uh, and the, the rest have been hedging and will continue to hedge the, uh, to in, in order to ensure their national interest 
one way or another. So um, what can be negotiated? The very uh, immediate uh, thing is the, the inclusivity. If Afghanistan's uh, new government uh, does not recognize that, uh, it will not succeed. Like every other government, there would be resistance, there would be conflict, there would be insurgencies, one way or another. This this such a, this uh, place is geographically uh, conducive to continuation of uh, such uh, issue and problem. Uh, unfortunately, the presentation of the at least the interim government that they have announced does not indicate that that we are going to that direction. Um, women have already become completely absent uh, from this uh, scene. That is already a problem because it is not only a moral or ethical issue of a, or an, an issue that they can bank on in terms of their relationship and popularity with the rest of the international community, mm -hmm. but it is actually a economic and security issue. Uh, which will be missing. It is like neglecting 50% of the potential right there. And then also in terms of the uh, reflection of the diversity of Afghanistan, including all different ethnic groups uh, that, that, that makes Afghanistan, that is the, the entire mosaic. You cannot neglect that. Uh, then uh, from a regional perspective and the uh, United Nations uh, potential for intervention, I, what I would say is that uh, the region, um, from what I assess, is uh, taking two modes. One, starting to hedge and invest that their uh, resources in terms of uh, having a good relationship with the Taliban for their own sake, but at the same time looking at what are the other options. Uh, and then the, the rest of the regional countries who have been less directly involved, they have adapted at this point, at least the wait and see strategy. Uh, and that basically that wait and see is about how the Taliban are going to conduct themselves, who is going to recognize them first, and whose steps they are going to follow. The, can the UN help? Uh, the UN uh, could have played a different role all along. Uh, and even at this point, there is a number of different possibilities. But whether we are talking about UN or international community or any groupings, what is required is really bold steps, commitment, patience, perseverance, and care, and, and, and wanting for Afghanistan to become peaceful. The question is, does that exist? This is the question. Um, and it's a question that you know has been asked and never fully answered, unfortunately. Um, let me turn now to Shamila a little bit to give some additional perspective. Shamila, you have been, you know, um, working on this challenge uh, for a long time. We've known each other a really long time. Uh, you've worked in the US government, uh, most importantly, you know, the NSC, um, at a time when the conversation about negotiating with the Taliban was just beginning. Give me a sense, um, first of all, when you kind of sit from that vantage point at the NSC, you know, what is missing from the picture in terms of interpreting the regional politics? How should we understand now Pakistan's um, relationship with the Taliban and then its influence over the regional and regional dynamics? How do we understand and interpret Russia, Iran, China? When you're when you're at the NSC level, and you're you're having that kind of conversation. Um, you know how much do those things factor into then the kind of the minutia, as it were, of navigating negotiations with all these different characters and players. Um, and how should we be thinking about this in the long term in light of what Ambassador Rahmani has said in terms of, uh, and Fatima has said about the, the need to continue negotiating towards some sort of peaceful settlement? Um, thank, for, first, thank you, Candice, and to New America for hosting this really important conversation. Um, it's 
really important for me to be in this group with many people who I admire and I've followed your work and, and um, your, your insights are so valuable. Um, and so I'll speak, I'll speak from this US government angle, which I think um, I, I would like us to just take a step back and not think of it as <clears throat> just the Biden administration or the Obama administration or Bush. Um, I, I see it all as a continuum of one policy that did of course evolve, but um, it's helpful to start by looking at it as the U.S. as the United States, because um, I, I think our the central challenge for the United States in approaching um, the war in Afghanistan and then solving it was that we it was never believable to any countries in the region or in the world that we actually had long term skin in the game. So meaning we, you know, obviously we were threatened by the security challenges in Afghanistan and had to go in quite swiftly um, to take action and to show strength after 9-11. Um, and even when we put in so many troops and then followed that on um, uh, subsequently with development and economic assistance and, and more diplomacy, I just, when I was at the NSC and even before that, I, we would talk to our foreign partners and no one believed us that we actually were gonna stay the course, right? Because the kind of skin that we had in the game was so, fleeting and temporary. And I think we felt that every step of the way as, um, you know, it, as we were, you know, those of us who are bureaucrats working in the churn of, you know, government policy, which is, can be very mundane and, and also quite urgent at the same time. So urgent that we don't have time to think through uh, in the nuance and thoughtfulness with the thoughtfulness that you all think about these issues. And you all know, cause you've been in these situations too. And so I, as I look back over the past 20 years, I see us, I see the United States like in this role of trying to behave like a regional actor and uh, trying to convince people that we care and we're gonna do follow this through. But at the same time, um, when I was at the NSC, what, in the Obama administration, one of the the, the critical kind of moments or departure from that narrative of we're going to see it through was when we started trying to socialize um, our own folks of, uh, about the negotiations. Like, it's okay to talk to the Taliban. It's okay to talk to people that are bad and that you disagree with and that are looking to hurt you. I have to say that that was one of the most difficult policy situations that I'd ever experienced. Like, it, you know, just in my short two decade career, um, it was astounding um, at the kind of the divisions in um, the U.S. system. And um, and I think some of that was just because of this confusion of what kind of skin do we actually have in the game? Like, do we care about women's rights and human rights? Intellectually, yes. But then how can we actually guarantee that? Right. You can't guarantee that unless you're on the ground and you're there for for life. You have to be a lifer for that. Right. So so there's this like bigger existential um, dilemma and conversation, I think, that continues today. And, and we, we are observing it now in kind of the dismay and, and sadness that many of us feel having worked on these policies and, and just to fall kind of flat on our feet, it feels like, okay? So that's that's one aspect of it from the U.S. perspective. Now, to, to your points, Candice, about the region, um, this is where, when we look at the countries in the region, these are countries that actually have skin in the game, right? So first and foremost, obviously the people of Afghanistan, the Taliban, the government that has fled, the people that are still there running things every day. I mean, there's those are the ones that have real skin in the game. And uh, I, I'm thinking of, in terms of the, the regional actors, I'm, I'm thinking of Pakistan, China, and there's Russia and there's Iran, okay? And then Pakistan's the big, always the elephant in the room. Um, and um, it's, you know, the, the, what we see happening in Afghanistan today is partially the result of decades-long Pakistan policy, working with the Taliban, nurturing it, providing it safe haven. Pakistan's not the only um, kind of facilitator of the Taliban's you know, sustainability in this war, but it has played a significant role. And um, if it's looking at the situation today in terms of any wins, I would say that um, Pakistan is is probably like very pleased that there isn't a pro-India or an India-friendly government in Afghanistan right now. That's obvious given their, their heavy, heavy focus on, um, on India and their national security policy. They do have some leverage over the Pakistan or over the Taliban in terms of um, 
you know, should the Taliban become a leg legitimate recognized government, um, there are important routes to the sea for trade and economic, um, you know, uh, engagement that are important for the Taliban. There's also a lot of illicit trade and back and forth on that border, which is important to um, both sides. So um, that will kind of factor into the, the how the relationship becomes stronger. Um, and then the Taliban, a lot of the Taliban's money. Um, is tied up in real estate in Pakistan and for in, in you know and and just things that they own and so this is not something that's been reported widely so there are these like linkages I think um, that sustain some leverage um, which Pakistan might think it can take advantage of now any of those wins I think are like they they pale in comparison to the risks in in fact um, because the Taliban is very close with. Um, the Pakistani Taliban, which is you know, anti-state, and um, even the fighters that were released by the Trump administration, like a lot of them are anti-Pakistan. So there's a concern that there's going to be this revival, uh, revivalism amongst the um, you know Islamists in Pakistan who are against the state. And so the fear of Islamist rebellion is very much on the minds of the Pakistanis, which is so ironic, right? Because this has been a factor of state policy for decades that they've been fomenting this, and now and we keep saying, oh, it's coming back. To bite them, but it, this is, I think, very different, because, and it's it's a bigger cause for concern because the U.S. doesn't have the the you know presence that it had for the past twenty years, and it doesn't need Pakistan anymore to for the air routes or the the um, routes on the ground, and so there's. Um, the way we frame that dynamic between the U.S. and Pakistan vis-a-vis uh, -vis Afghanistan is going to be very different, and it puts Pakistan in a very vulnerable space. Okay, there's a lot of unknown uh, regionally if you think about how the U.S. and Pakistan are going to engage on Afghanistan or any other issues, and so naturally that leads to things like fear of sanctions in Pakistan um, by the U.S. or the international community for its relationship with the Taliban, um, and so they're going to the Pakistanis and others are going to be watching very closely how the international community legitimizes Taliban the Taliban government. If it, if the Taliban government is legitimized and it's stable and it receives all the funding that it needs to you know, run a, a proper government, that's the best case scenario for the Pakistanis, right? Because then their whole legacy of playing both sides, it's not forgotten, but it hasn't kind of gone up in flames the way that um, a lot of us anticipate it to, okay? So that, and that's so complex and I'm, I'm simplifying it, but I, I wanted to make sure I, I painted that picture. Now, then you throw China into the mix. We all imagine like China and the Pakistanis and the Russians like high-fiving each other and, and, and kind of like taking great joy in the, the collapse of the US war in Afghanistan and 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 how, right? And and I think that there is a little bit of, of engaging in schadenfreude uh, and, and, you know, seeing it, the US loss as a symbolic win. But again, I think it's, it's it stops there because the Pakistanis um, or the Chinese, like the Pakistanis, are very concerned about spillover um, into their territory of again Islamist rebellion, right? And 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 in the influence of the Taliban and and their you know their defeat of the U.S. This is the complete defeat of the United States by an Islamic insurgency in Afghanistan. Can you imagine how that inspires all of these other groups that China and Russia and Pakistan and others have to have to contend with for just to strengthen their sovereignty? So I think there's a there's a lot there that the Chinese aren't stating out loud, obviously, and that's why we see them. Um, as Ambassador Romani mentioned, like these states are going straight to the Taliban to protect their interests. And so the Chinese very much fall into that. Um, and same goes for the Russians. I think that they have similar interests as the Chinese in terms of security. Um, the Chinese probably have more economic um, interests in, in Afghanistan, mainly in the mining sector. Um, so that's something that we should watch. And then with Iran, it's, it's a little bit more nuanced. Like the Iranians are concerned about the way that the Taliban a Taliban government might treat Shia minorities. But I also think that um, the Iranians are looking at how the United States, President Biden in particular, dealt with Afghanistan. Like we've talked about this, that you know Biden has always wanted to leave and he came in and he left. And he he has shed any responsibility of like what happened in the aftermath as something domestic and civil. Now, Iran is likely watching this and thinking, okay, so, Point taken. Let's take some notes on this. When the United States comes to us to start talking about their Iran policy and talking about JCPOA, like we're, we're we should probably believe him that he's going to do what he's going, you know, what he's saying he's going to do. He's been very consistent. So I think um, there's an interesting dynamic there to to observe. And likewise, like 
a little bit further, but still related are the, the Gulf countries and kind of how they're watching the, the issues in the region and how they partner with the United States. That partnership dynamic is going to change. Um, we, we likely will need them more because we have a presence in the Gulf that we're, and we're using that presence to watch Afghanistan. But at the same time, we're going to be pushing the responsibility to them more because we don't, we really don't, the United States does not want to focus on Afghanistan anymore. I think that's what I've learned from all of this is that they wanted to be done with it yesterday, unfortunately. Um, so let me stop there. Well, they wanted to be done with it yesterday, but we've also been to this movie before, right? I mean, yeah. if we remember uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush, you know, when he first took office um, and, you know, the, the insurgency was still happening against the Soviets, he asked, oh, is that thing still going on? Um, so as much as, you know, uh, current administration, maybe the next or the next after would like to move its focus away from Afghanistan, it's unlikely uh, that they're going to be able to do that um, so quickly and I think so cleanly. But I want to make uh, just to tack, tack on to your point on Iran before I turn to Gianni here. Um, you know, I think it's an interesting observation that the JCPOA negotiations in some ways are made more credible by um, Biden sticking to the deal. Um, what was key here, and I think we, we missed this, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, Fatima very well pointed out, Biden was clear in his commitments even before he took office. He always had the same line. He wanted a CT policy, not a uh, coin policy, uh, as far as Afghanistan goes. And, uh, you know, he was very clear that there was really no nation building to be done in Afghanistan as far as he was concerned. Um, but more importantly, from a continuity of policy perspective, um, you know, the signal was the U.S. made a deal. It's going to stick to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unlike um, the previous administration, uh, which basically seemed to break with that entire tradition, um, you know, of sticking to the deals um, and the principles uh, that you have publicly said you're committed to. Um, so in some ways for Iran, a uh, big signal to take away in terms of um, not just JCPOA, but also, uh, frankly, for all of the players, uh, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, China, one big important takeaway for regional players should be, um, you know, attack the United States again, and you might count on another 20 years of chaos. Um, and you might and and you might come out with an outcome just the same, just as chaotic, um, just as costly, uh, and just as sort of nonsensical. Gianni, let me turn to you because you've raised, uh, you know, in our conversations, questions about kind of the regional impact as well, um, considerations about you know Kashmir uh, and how, for instance, this um, Islamist victory might play out in a place like Kashmir, but also regionally. But also, you were on the ground in Afghanistan at the time. What, how should we interpret events, but also how should we think about um, the way resistance to the Taliban might play out over the next couple of years? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Candace. Um, I, I honestly, uh, I feel like I need to work backwards from some of the conversations that we had. I'll, I'll start with the JCPOA. Uh, I, if I was the Iranians, I'd be doing dances about the way we keep deals, uh, because quite frankly, uh, I personally would not want to get in a negotiation with an Iranian because they are far better uh, negotiators than any of us. They're going to walk away with my trousers by the end of the of the of the deal. Uh, but 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 I think that if you look at the way we've signed up for a bad deal and kept to it is is sort of the most disturbing. Um, the, the I think one of the biggest takeaways even from this conversation and Fatima mentioned something that I think is incredibly um, important to highlight. The only people who actually believed uh, this uh, negotiation was somehow going to work was, was the international community and the U.S. Uh, no Afghan I talked to, um, although I, I believe Fatima and, and her colleagues were there with the best intentions and trying to work something out, I don't think that anybody I ever talked to had any high aspirations about this um, ever, ever working out. In fact, if you look at it with what Shamila mentioned in the continuity of our engagement rather than one president at a time, uh, you'll see a continuity of good ideas, experimental plans, 
silver bullets, things that are going to get us out of whatever mess we're in, in short term, and somehow it's all going to work out. Now, the, uh, the good thing about video or DVDs or I'm dating myself, you know, cassettes, um, is that you can actually roll back the tapes and see a lot of stuff. And I think one of the issues that New America has done over the years, and I've lost track, literally lost track, how many of these conversations we've had over the years where we've literally outlined exactly how this thing is going to pan out, exactly how dangerous these these experimental uh, things were going to be, and and somehow we're the outliers, you know. And and now you see everybody uh, with a great opinion. Some of these uh, individuals who have literally been at the wheel while this train wreck was has been happening, coming up with commentary on on so, somehow it, it could have been prevented or. Um, yeah, well, you didn't do it back then. And I find it disturbing, absolutely disturbing, and quite frankly, intellectually numbing that we would say something to the effect of um, nobody could see this thing coming. Like we didn't actually pay attention to the 1990s and how this thing came apart. Like we didn't see how Najibula gave up and within a month, Kabul fell. We didn't look at how the Taliban actually entered Kabul in 1996. You know, all these things, I mean, it's impossible. And then on top of it, if you look at what President Ghani was doing and his advisors, I think Fatima is being very generous and in, in her commentary, and I, I'm sure ambassador as well, uh, but I won't be as kind. Uh, you know, a lot of the uh, people that were around him were changing shifting the decks of the Titanic, you know, shifting the chairs on the Titanic right until the end and making it actually incredibly difficult to fight the the last few provinces on the way to Kabul. Um, and also when you assign so many governors that have no business being governors to begin with, and then assign them to some of the most important provinces when you see them abandon their post and, and only make deals that get their families out, forget anybody else, I think that that's how something falls apart. And if you can't see that, then I question our integrity of a system that doesn't tell um, you know, our senior leaders uh, this is happening because you know, it's, it's easy to see. It's not as difficult. So fast forward to today, and, and where we are, uh, I think that if you look at what, again, we've talked about over the years, and if you look at what has happened, uh, I'm not convinced that the killing is done. Uh, I'm not convinced that the merciless policies of the Taliban are going to get any more moderate. Uh, I'm not convinced that the um, uh, there's no risk that there's going to be intra-Taliban fighting. Uh, between different factions, uh, and certainly the gen the genocide and, and cleansing that's going on in different parts of Kabul, Panjshir, and and other and other provinces, is not being uh, documented, quite frankly, because we even took out the journalists, uh, you know, in the first bunch of airplanes. As far as I'm concerned, uh, there are some brave people reporting right now. Thank God for the people with their phones and thank God for every brave Afghan that pulls out a phone and records the atrocities. Um, but honestly, I, I find it disturbing. Um, and then the last thing to answer your question again backwards, because I, I don't want to take up too much time, um, is um, look, uh, the Taliban came to power in 1996. Yes, there were some Arabs uh, and, and different uh, groups that uh, that were there in 1996, but most of the um, the terrorist enterprise uh, uh, and Al Qaeda Inc moved in afterwards. Uh, we don't have to wait long until those terrorists take take uh, action. They're right now. They're right in Afghanistan. They're taking part in the fight in Panjshir, um, and quite frankly, they are going to take. Uh, 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 their action and their act to other countries and export it 
And we're going to be staring at this problem set for a long time. So whether it's Kashmir, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, I, uh, friends of mine have been telling me, uh, you know, the some of the special forces, the Taliban special forces are not, uh, they're, they don't actually speak Pashto, Dari. Uh, they speak Urdu to each other, they, or even with some uh, North Waziristan accents and, 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 and dialects. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of people in Kabul right now that, uh, and in the provinces that, that are not Afghan. And, and this, is, uh, this is very disturbing, honestly. Totally disturbing. Um, and I think some really important points here. Um, I also just want to remind the audience that, um, you know, we're going to take some Q&A here. So if you've got questions that you're thinking about, if this is provoking thoughts, um, please get them in there on the, on the right-hand side of the video uh, there's a little box where you can answer your your questions. Um, we're not quite there yet. We're going to kind of, uh, I think we've so much to unpack here. But Johnny, you um, pointed out two things that I think are critical to understand. First of all, let me give a shout out to some of the reporters out there who are just doing amazing work. Um, obviously, critically, Lise Doucette, um, a legend out there, um, still on the front line. So many Afghan reporters uh, with Tolo, um, you know, with Pajwak News. Uh, who are really out there um, doing the brave work of trying to document uh, what's going on in the country at a time when there is actually a lot of vi violence and a lot of fear, um, especially Panjshir. We have not really kind of unpacked the Panjshir piece. Um, we know uh, from social media reporting that there are, you know, reports of mass graves, um, you know, wholesale slaughter in the valley, um, still no verification. If there's one need out there right now, I think it is for you know some sort of ability for uh, Afghan journalists, uh, if they speak Pashto, Dari, or otherwise, um, to be able to document, um, use social media, use what's out there to document what's happening, um, because clearly the violence and the killing has only just begun, uh, and we are in for a long haul, as you just pointed out, Gianni. Uh, to your second point about uh, the, these reports of uh, foreigners, um, you know, speaking other languages. Uh, potentially affiliated with different branches of the Haqqani network coming primarily from Waziristan. Again, that still needs to be investigated a little bit more. I think we need to see some more proof, but I, I certainly have been hearing some of the same things that you're hearing. Now, obviously that's troubling. Um, here are the two reasons it's troubling, and I want to turn to uh, Fatima and uh, Ambassador Rahmani to talk a little bit about this. One is that we have... Um, you know, clearly we do not have an inclusive government uh, in Afghanistan right now, but we also have an extremely factionalized Taliban government. Uh, I may be wrong in perceiving this. I'd like to get your perspective uh, on sort of the Haqqani network um, versus the old guard and versus the rank and file, how we should interpret these kind of emerging rumors of splits and, and, uh, and um, factionalism within and how that might play out for, for the regime going forward, let's say over the next uh, six months to a year. Fatima, what do you think about um, some of these challenges um, in terms of the Taliban itself um, and factional, factionalism within? Um, <clears throat> quite frankly, it is very difficult uh, to talk when you're outside the country. You see things controversial things uh, from every side, and it is very difficult to see. Uh, I'm always an optimistic. I was called a crazy woman who thought the Soviets will get out of Afghanistan. People have been in this game for two decades. I have been in this game for four decades. Exactly 43 years ago, I was in the um, politics of jihad and then Mujahideen, and then uh, till today. When Taliban um, took Afghanistan after a very bad um, Mujahideen's uh, interfighting and <clears throat> Afghanistan in a chaos was a different country. Anything would good, look good in a few days, everything. Afghanistan is not that Afghanistan anymore. This is Afghanistan or, or of all Afghans, all ethnicity, all gender, men and women. And this is an Afghanistan that we learned in spite of, um, in spite of uh, bad governance and uh, corrupt people and all that. But there were lots of good things in this country. What women achieved in Afghanistan for the last 20 years, never in the history of Afghanistan, women did achieve such a thing. Freedom of speech, 
um, involvement of everyone, equality of all ethnic groups and all that. This is the new Afghanistan that Taliban have taken over. And it is not easy to dismiss these people. It is not easy uh, to ignore these people. It is not easy to shove them under uh, somewhere and, and just forget about them. No one will be silent. So it is for their own good. It is for the, their own good that they will take all this seriously. If this government is not inclusive, they have to think very harder and have the next step uh, inclusive. Now they have to run a country. They have to feed people. They have to give salaries. And they already have a problem. They will understand that it is not uh, an easy thing to run a country. Taking a country is much easier than running a country. My hope is that they will open their eyes and they will be more realistic and in, uh, start being inclusive. Very close to what we were trying to achieve, that the 50% that I was talking about, that we, were, we wanted to get the 100% of what we wanted and the Taliban wanted to get uh, 100% of their desire. But I always believe that this 50% or 40%, that as long as it's inclusive, it should be good enough for us. I think we have to come to that. We have to, we simply have to help Afghanistan, people of Afghanistan, to come to, uh, to an understanding that this country, this nation, cannot afford another war. They cannot afford a civil war. I mean, enough is enough. 43 years is absolutely enough. We woke up every day with a new idol created for us by the foreigners. I remember during the jihad time, the guru was Mr. Hikmatyar. No one was allowed to talk against it. Your country, if you talked about Hikmatyar, you were labeled Gucci Muj, as we were, or uh, I mean, everything, uh, everybody was labeled, no, this is good, this is good. Then someone else's turn came, then that other person is good. Then Taliban were good, and everyone had to get rid of the Mujahideen. Then the same Mujahideen were brought back to get rid of Taliban. We are confused. We really need all of you, the whole re region, especially by the whole world, the international community, to help us to find our own path. And we have to find a way to negotiate ourselves. The country cannot uh, go on like that. It simply cannot. The rule of the region is extremely important. If the region think that by mischievous behaviors, they can use Afghanistan, I will assure you, this fire from Afghanistan will burn the skirt of each and one, each one of these countries around us. A peaceful Afghanistan will be good for all of them, for all of them. That's why I would like to go and see that what could be done from within the country. Hearing something from outside and seeing things from inside is two different things. Totally different things. I, I, I believe very much in social media. I believe that everyone has a camera uh, in their pocket and they will inform the pocket. Most of the time, I'm grateful for that. But sometimes it is, becomes confusing. So we have to see. We have to see what is happening um, in the field. So I, I see Shmila, sorry, I apologize. I, I want to just, because I see Shmila um, nodding her head a little bit, and I also see Ambassador Rahmani. I don't want to interrupt, um, but I just, I want to give them a chance, because you've, you've hit on yes. a lot of points, uh, Fatima, that are really important, which is um, there have been idols in the past, right? Uh, and, you know, the risk here is that there will be idols again. The, the Taliban might try and ele elevate themselves once again as the kind of the, the idol that cannot be touched. And yet an, uh, an outsider, an outsider will, will create idols for us too. That's right. And also an outsider will come uh, yes. and, and create another idol. And will say that this this is this is new this, new idol. Follow yeah. this person. Exactly. This should not happen. Yeah. No, in fact, uh, and in fact that let me use open, open this very important question, which for me, I'm really struggling with. 
you have a constitution in Afghanistan. It's it's an imperfect constitution. Uh, it's you know it's essentially a rebaked 1964 constitution. Um, you have a, a a kind of political dispensation, an institutional structure. Um, if if the Taliban abandons that, you know what what can we look forward to in terms of just the structure of decision making? Uh, we have no way of knowing. We have no way of understanding what's coming uh, simply because it's not clear at all um, that there is any intent to create that structure beyond kind of regionalized uh, councils that would ostensibly un be under the control of the Taliban. So let me turn um, first to Shamila and then get to Ambassador Rahmani for quick takes on this. Um, and I also want to just remind you that we're going to try and open up to Q&A in a little bit here. Go ahead, Shamila. Um, so I just I wanted to make a comment just that um, I, I I think that the it's a very natural worry to think that what we did in the past will repeat itself. Um, but I, I do want to recognize that after the 9-11 attacks, there were all of these different um, multilateral like frameworks and regional groupings and um, consultations that were put into place that um, fostered greater communication between the international community on things like terrorist finance, for example, or the movement of suspected terrorists between countries and the surveillance of those groups and individuals. And so the ability of the transnational like terrorist networks and, and groups that, that Gianni was mentioning in Afghanistan, like the, the concern about that, um, I think it's very valid. And I myself am like, I think about it all the time, but I also know that in terms of the policy infrastructure that's been built up, although it's imperfect, um, that there there are systems in place that can continue to um, kind of monitor and observe those um, those kinds of dynamics, right? So, but the, my my worry is that they all become all these groups and individuals that are bad for Afghanistan just stay in Afghanistan because of the you know the regional partners don't want this spillover to go in their countries and the United States is kind of washing their hands of it. So it's still very much a question of insecurity, but I I, I just don't want to discount all these mechanisms that we have developed. Um, and we also, on top of that, the other point I wanted to make was, um, you know, I agree with Fatima in her remarks that, you know, we the international community still needs to be involved. Like we we should absolutely not wash our hands of of these questions of governance and, and legitimacy and, and, and helping Afghanistan. And so this is where all of these regional um, uh, groupings that you see, you know, Tony Blinken is going to all these meetings and, you know, it, it's interesting because they weren't going to these meetings before, right? It's only in the kind of once this all unfolded. And if if the United States had been pursuing such aggressive diplomacy before, I think we might have been in a different situation. It's something that we did try to do during the Obama administration um, with the appointment of various you know, senior officials and principals. It was hard to do, um, but that's really the only way that this is going to sustain itself, right? If, if you have countries that don't see eye to eye, like Russia, Pakistan, the United States and China, like sitting down, and having very uncomfortable conversations and then bringing others into the fold as well, right? And right now, I think the uncertainty that was making me uncomfortable is there's not one, one dialogue that I can point to to say, hey, that's the one, and they're all talking about it there. We're not there yet, right? But I would hope that after two decades of funding counterterrorism and military hardware capabilities and surveillance that we would actually start putting our efforts and focus into diplomacy and, and all the good things that come with diplomacy when you really focus on it, like, uh, you know, uh, humanitarian assistance and economic assistance, all of that. For the, so again, thinking in the future. Let me stop there. Yeah, well, listen, a uh, very good point on diplomacy. I'm going to turn to our chief diplomat here in a second, but let me just tell the audience, um, you know, we were scheduled to close out at, at 145, but this conversation is too important. It's too rich. Um, so we're going to try and extend a little bit. If you have questions, I just want to remind you once again, uh, comments, uh, please drop them in the right-hand side of the box here, um, and we will get to those um, very shortly before I turn to Ambassador Rahmani. So uh, we're going to extend a little bit, um, try and go to about two o'clock um, so we can keep the conversation going, because I think, um, as Gianni very well pointed out, um, the people on this panel um, and I think New America writ large, you know, all the different fellows who've worked uh, and reported on the region in Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, I think we've been saying, you know, we've been kind of shouting into the wind um, for the better part of two decades 
um, that we need a different approach uh, to Afghanistan generally and to the region writ large. And I'm hopeful that um, now with the kind of the din of, you know, the coinistas and, you know, the naysayers now kind of starting to be a little bit quieter, um, our voices will start to reach um, the right ears. And on your point on uh, diplomacy, Shamila, couldn't agree more. I don't know where um, Zal Khalilzad was. Maybe he was just overtaxed. Maybe there, maybe we needed two envoys. Uh, I don't really know. Um, but it seems like one of the bigger failures was the, the lack of robust engagement uh, with regional players um, in a very visible way, also that would send a signal about the U.S. seriousness to move beyond just a Taliban dispensation. Ambassador Rahmani, your thoughts on that? Uh, well, uh, there is a few different segments to it. Let me start first with the one in terms of the negotiations. Uh, the negotiations, uh, while I am not a, was not a part of it, uh, Ms. Galani was actively there and, and she um, can tell us all about it, but the, it, it was flawed because it was entered uh, under the circumstances that there was a time limit for one side, number one. The strength was growing uh, on Taliban's favor, second. The third one, it was continuously a, a shifting balance in favor of Taliban. So that, that was not a very realistic negotiations. Uh, whoever conducted that, given that, um, as Ms. Gailani uh, explained before, uh, there was this dragging strategy that was adopted by the Afghan government, uh, the Taliban did their part. In the, in the middle of it, what we lost was getting to a solution. We did not get to a solution because both sides were dragging. They both felt that they had some advantage in that. Um, and who lost? The people of Afghanistan. So now moving forward uh, and with the United States diplomacy, while I agree with uh, much that Shmaila was sharing with us, I would also like to play the other side and say that while we did not succeed with your troops there, with the attention there, with the funding there, how we could possibly do it without them. No, not even having the journalists there to report. So like it was said before, it seems to me, and, and Shmaila said it too, that it seems like the United States at this point says, okay, I am washing my hands off, let the others deal with this. And the issue continues as following. When the war was continuing or the conflict was continuing for the past 20 years in Afghanistan, we all knew where the roots were and how it could have had a game-changing impact, denying Taliban the sanctuary they had in Pakistan. That could have had a game-changing impact. Now it would be another shift meaning Afghanistan probably would become this source and hub for the groups to return and uh, be trained and establish themselves and be financed and whatnot. And then the symptoms of it would be treated wherever else that they are going to spread uh, from Afghanistan too. So uh, I am not completely discounting the importance and the power of diplomacy. But what was already said here in terms of new approaches, courageous steps, bold decisions need to be made, taken if we really want a different outcome. One of the things that I have been repeating at least over the past couple of months that if we are trying the same strategy that has already failed, trying it one more time is not gonna make it succeed. So um, I, I, I would leave it at that. 
A lot to unpack there. Uh, I mean, Ambassador Rahmani, uh, you make a really important point about the safe haven uh, in Pakistan. The challenge, I think, and I think, Gianni, I'm going to turn to you for some perspective on this since, you know, of course, you know the, the terrain very well. But the challenge, of course, for the United States always was um, it was a tough neighborhood and it was always the, the ugly kid uh, in the classroom. Uh, essentially, you know, there was there were very few actors in the region uh, that didn't welcome the opportunity to beat up on the United States and its NATO allies uh, over the last 20 years, um, not just out of schadenfreude, literally by, you know, um, supporting um, safe havens for Al-Qaeda um, and for the Taliban, uh, and of course, um, kind of fueling this discord even within uh, the coalition itself, right? So, uh, and I, I just want to also point out, we have not once only glancingly mentioned India here. Uh, we keep talking about Russia and China and Iran uh, as the as the kids on the block who have to be helpful in making the decisions. Uh, I mean, I think we kind of know that Turkish, Turkmenistan uh, you know, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan are kind of side players in this show that are mostly directed by Russia. Um, but uh, it's interesting to me that after all these years, uh, we're not talking about India as a as an influencing factor, although it still could be uh, given its positioning with with China. But let, let me um, start answering, asking and answering some of these questions that are coming to us from the audience and turn to you, Gianni. Um, one, for some comments on, on what we've just heard from Ambassador Rahmani and Fatima, but also uh, lots of questions here um, about the future of over the horizon counterterrorism. And I think you're probably pretty well positioned uh, to answer that. Is that, a, you know, is that realistic? I mean, what, what are the what are the prospects for the success of over the horizon counterterrorism operations from your point of view? Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, uh, Ambassador Rahmani was exactly right in, in highlighting that with all the resources on the planet effectively focused on Afghanistan, I, I, let's let's admit that the first eight nine years of it was not exactly um, uh, well focused. Uh, in fact, we went from uh, you know famine to feast. Uh, in essence, putting, you know, 100 plus thousand troops, uh, you know, after we don't we do nothing with uh, with Afghanistan for six years. You know, I mean, this is uh, in, incredible. Who, you know, you can't even comprehend the the, the uh, waste. Uh, I keep using the term we tend to overspend and underthink Afghanistan, and and it's unfortunately, uh, you know, true. Um, but when it comes to uh, the diplomacy, honestly, I I don't I don't want to be the naysayer here, but I, I don't feel very comfortable with uh, the fact that we are uh, using hope as a strategy. You know, we hope things are going to work out. We don't necessarily plan for them to work out we don't put the parameters or the or the plans in place to work out and and I'll I'll tie that into the over the horizon um look the, the military didn't train me for uh, a lot of things but they spent a hell of a lot of money to 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 put me through schools to be a strategist and and strategy is is you know kind of working different means that you have available uh with a plan to kind of come to a conclusion that you want, but you work backwards from the objective. So if you want to have an over the horizon capability, you'd want to have bases in the area. You want to be able to have uh, the ability to, to conduct both reconnaissance, surveillance, the intelligence that you need, which a lot of it has to be on the ground. And, uh, and you need to have the ability to, to conduct operations in this. However, we did this. Uh, you know, right now we're we don't have any bases in the area. Our closest base is, you know, in Qatar. Uh, for uh, UAVs to fly there, have to fly, you know, seven eight hours, and then have a few hours on station, and then fly back. Um, if you we saw the uh, strike at the airport just prior to the. Uh, August, uh, you know, the end of uh, of our commitment there and evacuation. Um, I, I think at a minimum that uh, you know, although an investigation is going on, and I'm sure some things are going to come out, uh, the New York Times and Washington Post and a bunch of others have pointed out that you know you can't quite see uh, exactly what you need to see from just above. Uh, so having the the presence on the ground is important. 
uh, we sort of have torched that uh, right now. Uh, having a base like Bagram Airfield um, in the region and, and being able to, 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 to monitor activity, we gave up the, the greatest uh, treasure, you know, the greatest gem of, uh, of, uh, of U.S. national security and giving up Afghanistan, as far as I'm concerned, in Central Asia. Um, that is a strategic problem that we're going to have to live with for, for decades. Um, and, and over the horizon, again, to just, you know, for people that um, are, are well-versed in military affairs, I don't think that it's going to come as a surprise, but um, you can have different intelligence mechanisms, but if you don't have a, a ground perspective, is like, uh, you know, basically operating in a two-dimensional uh, uh, sphere with, with not the ability to see what's going on and understand what's happening. You may think something is happening. You may think this is a group of people uh, that are military-age males, but unless you have somebody on the ground that can tell you, actually, you know, uh, they just came from a, uh, you know, from an NGO and they're carrying water. They're not carrying, uh, a, you know, explosives you may actually come up with the wrong solution. So again, all that stuff is gonna come out, but it certainly doesn't bode well for any over the horizon capability that we have built. All very good points. Um, and I just wanna remind folks, we only have about eight minutes left, unfortunately, and we could go on for hours. Uh, clearly, we're gonna to have to start our own show. It's gonna be sort of the what, what if show for Afghanistan. Um, so let me just pick up on something you said, and then also turn to some, some more of these audience questions. Um, clearly, we have an intelligence failure problem when it comes to Afghanistan if um, we're, we're relying on the kind of interpersonal relationship between Anthony Blinken and Ashraf Ghani to determine um, whether or not we have confidence uh, in the Afghan government's staying power. Um, clearly, we have a problem uh, when we're not reading signals like the lack of a mediator on, on the Afghan government side as a sure sign uh, that there is something wrong uh, with the mechanics of, of the orchestration of our exit. Um, and, I, and to your point, Gianni, uh, you know, whatever the outcome of this investigation into that strike um, in, in Kabul, uh, clearly there are indications that something went wrong there. Uh, and another sign that over the horizon might be um, a, a bit of an overblown fantasy that we'll have to question and challenge now for the next you know, decade or so. Let me, um, there's so many questions here. Uh, let me try and get to at least a couple of them. Uh, and wrap them up together. So from our colleague, Mia Bloom, um, she has kind of two questions that I think are interesting and somewhat interrelated. One, we wanna talk a little bit about the role of corruption, but she has a very provocative question uh, that I think is not asked enough. What is the possibility, what is the prospect of Afghan women uh, taking up arms to uh, defend their rights um, or to change circumstances on the ground in the construct that we have today with the Taliban government. I'm gonna to turn to our two Afghan colleagues, uh, first to Fatima and then uh, Ambassador Rahmani, but just remind you uh, that we have to be short and sweet because we wanna get two more questions in. Fatima. Well, I'm, I have always been in the humanitarian field. Uh, for me, it's very difficult to encourage anyone to take arms. I am all for having Afghanistan back to peace. And I think the other question, the uh, the corruption, the corruption was the mother of all the evils which happened in Afghanistan. And unfortunately, <clears throat> especially the US, but most countries closed their eyes when it happened at the beginning. If they had, hadn't closed their eyes, most of things would have changed, would have been different today. Definitely, if we had not been having $10,000 top-ups a month um, for certain ministers, uh, for years, uh, we might. That's see, nothing. Uh, that's, that's nothing. That's, a drop that's nothing. I'm talking. I'm talking about single, uh, single source friends uh, to give contracts of millions of millions of dollars. These, uh, yes, one of the ministers I saw that had a, a salary of uh, I don't know how many thousands. I nearly had a heart attack because I, as the president of the Afghan Red Christian Society, worked as a volunteer for uh, 13 years. So for me, it was a shock, but that was nothing. I'm talking about contracts which were given to friends. That was the American money. It was the foreign money. And those uh, countries closed their eyes. 
That was the mother of all the evils. Millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. You're absolutely right, 100%. Ambassador Rahmani. Well, on the uh, first question about women um, picking up arms, uh, I would say let's not please uh, encourage women or or use them as as now uh, perpetuating conflict and war. They have suffered the most from conflict in more ways than anyone else, and then by thinking that, that they can pick up arm and kill more people, I think we have had enough killings. Enough is enough. And they have been the victims of it in way more ways than uh, anyone could possibly imagine. It is not, in fact, imaginable unless you have lived in conflict, unless you have experienced it close up. And, and you have been close enough to think that, that it, I am next and my family is next and continuously worry about your family coming back home or not and in one piece or not. Um, second on the uh, issue, I, I think women can play a major role and they are absolutely necessary in security field, but not necessarily to pick up arm and, con and, and make another insurgency or resistance or something like that. And we have played these games for way too long. In fact, all of my life. Um, the, on, on the on the issue of corruption, I can't agree more. It, it has been the mother of the evil. I'm intentionally repeating the same words as Ms. Gailani has said. And, and um, uh, given and your example about the ministers having like very fat salaries, I think that was a good thing. That That's a positive example because it's at least at the book. It's a salary. Uh, uh, the, the reason that the country is where it is is because of the many examples of the corruption happening through a chain from the contracts coming from its source. In fact, never leaving the countries that contracted them all the way uh, to, to uh, the way that, that uh, millions and hundreds of millions of contracts were sole sourced. It was just a friends club. Uh, and uh, uh, again, I'm emphasizing the point that Ms. Gailani raised that the international community overlooked, continuously overlooked, um, and stability was the the pretext or the or the excuse for it and that was a problem the lack of rule of law in fact the dysfunctional justice system has been the core of misery for afghanistan for many many decades historically and it will continue to be the law only applies to the powerless to scapegoat them not for those that that do the real deals because they are all friends. They all benefit from one another. And those are the ones that wouldn't speak up because they all have something that they have shared in these deals. A special club. Well, I'm afraid um, we are really very close to time here. So I, I wanna, first of all, uh, I wanna thank you, Fatima. I know it's late, <laughs> you, you, you know, and you've joined us here um, at a time when things are chaotic. I appreciate you staying up <laughs> and sticking with us and joining us. Um, Ambassador Rahmani, uh, I want to thank you um, for your continued you know, courage in speaking out about what you know, what you've seen. Shamila, I mean, just no words. Um, we've been around this bend so many times, I'm getting dizzy. Uh, and you too, Gianni. I think um, we're at a point now uh, where as much as you know, the United States would like to wipe the slate clean, forget about um, its focus on Afghanistan over the last 20 years, I have a feeling we'll be back here uh, at the What Next for Afghanistan show uh, in no time flat. And unfortunately, that is uh, the legacy that the United States leaves behind. Um, but there is also another legacy here, which is the bonds between us all uh, that bring us together um, to reach across borders and all of our differences and all the losses of lives. Um, these bonds are unbreakable, and I'm glad um, to know you uh, and to keep this conversation going uh, and hope for the best um, and pray for peace in Afghanistan. With that, I'm gonna take it over to Peter Bergen, who's gonna join us in just a few seconds here um, and let us know what's next.